From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. Donald Trump crisscrosses Washington today, pitching higher tariffs and lower taxes to Republican lawmakers and business leaders. A split screen with President Biden appearing alongside Ukrainian President Zelensky at the G7 in Italy. The U.S. and Ukraine, they're signing a 10-year security deal with members also agreeing on how to tap frozen Russian assets to fund the country's war effort. We'll have more with Evelyn Farkas of the McCain Institute. And the Supreme Court preserves full access to a widely used abortion pill, Mifepristone, a unanimous ruling with major implications for reproductive rights and electoral politics. Elizabeth Wydra of the Constitutional Accountability Center joins us with reaction. So certainly, Joe, no shortage of news today abroad in Italy or here in Washington, where sure. it was not only the legislative branch and Republicans meeting with Donald Trump that got attention, but the highest court in the land as well. Yeah, that's true. A Supreme Court ruling on Mifepristone holding up access uh, to the abortion pill, something that was sort of the backdrop for a very busy day today in Washington for the former president, Donald Trump, meeting earlier with Republican members of the House as well, Republican members of the Senate. He delivered brief remarks following those meetings. This is an outstanding group of people. I'm with them a thousand percent. They're with me a thousand percent. We agree just about on everything. And if there isn't, we work it out. And we've had a, I've had a really great relationship with just about everybody here, with everybody here, and just about all of the senators. And uh, if it wasn't fantastic, it gets worked out. And it wasn't just pleasantries with senators either, but members of the House, including most of Republican leadership, praising the former president. It was a unifying event, and I'm grateful to the president for answering questions from our colleagues today. President Trump brought an, an extraordinary amount of energy and excitement and enthusiasm this morning. He showed us that energy, and he showed us that positive outlook. A lot of unifying messages from President Trump, but also optimistic messages. We are 100 percent unified behind his candidacy. We are incredibly unified in working with President Trump to get him elected. Bloomberg's Gregory Cordy is joining us now with more. So, Gregory, it was a message of unity, sure, but he also had some policy ideas he was floating in these meeting rooms today. Yeah, he talked a lot about tax policy. He wants to raise tariffs in order to, he said, reduce the individual income tax rates. Usually when he's talking about tariffs, he's talking about it in terms of protectionism, in terms of uh, protecting American workers and industries uh, and as a matter of trade policy. Here he's incorporating it into a larger developing tax policy ahead of the expiration of the Trump tax cuts next year. And he also talked about reducing the corporate tax rate from 21 percent to 20 percent, which is a little bit of a departure from his thinking earlier in the year when he was thinking, no, the cuts are all going to be on the individual side. I've done everything I can do uh, on the corporate side. But he th says 20 percent is a nice round number. He like, Trump likes round numbers. So you talk, we talked about the split screen uh, campaign here with uh, Trump uh, here in Washington and, and President Biden at the G7 in, in Italy. Uh, in both cases, you had guys trying to show that they can govern. Um, this is a departure from the, the, the Trump that we've seen at the courthouse in New York ranting against uh, witch hunts. This was The message today was, elect me and I can work with this, members of these Congress to get something done. Of course, uh, if they had acted all of these, they made the tax cuts permanent, cut the corporate tax rate further. According to research by the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, it would add upwards of $5 trillion to the deficit. It. Donald Trump spoke as well to the business roundtable today. Ninety prominent CEOs, maybe more, showed up. Kaylee was outside this conversation earlier. Tim Cook, uh, Jamie Dimon listening to this. Are they not concerned about ballooning deficits while we're concerned about inflation? Oh, I think there's uh, some concern uh, across the spectrum about uh, both President Biden and former President Trump. Neither of their policies have been particularly friendly to budget hawks who mm -hmm. want to see us make some progress. On, uh, on debt, particularly as a percentage of, of GDP. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, when you're talking to a corporate crowd, they like, like, like hearing about yeah. these corporate tax cuts. Uh, and so I think that's what, what they were responding to. 
It's interesting that some of these executives were pretty vocal after January 6th yeah. in opposition of Donald Trump and what had gone down that day that now seem to be warming back up to him. And I have to say, as lawmakers were walking in the room, there were protesters outside uh, suggesting, you know, you're supporting an insurrectionist. Mike Pence was about to hang, trying to remind lawmakers of this. Even Mitt Romney, who voted to impeach Donald Trump attended this meeting. What is his return to the Capitol for the first time since January 6 happened? Mind you, show us about how far we've come in politics since that day. Also extraordinary, I think, we've seen reporting that uh, President Trump endorsed Larry Hogan for Senate behind <laughs> closed doors. Larry Hogan, of course, a Republican former governor of Maryland who considered running against Trump under a third party banner. Uh, and now apparently they, they seem to maybe have been reconciled. Trump, look, President Trump, if he's going to get reelected, if he's going to get anything done, would like a Republican Senate and a Republican House. And so the message of today seemed to be the party is unifying around him. And that Trump mm -hmm. wants not just to be elected president, but he wants a governing majority mm -hmm. to enact a lot of these policies we've been talking about. You have to admit, though, and I think you're, you're pointing to this, Kaylee, if you went back to January 7th, yeah. 2020, and predicted this day here and the reception that Donald Trump got coming back to Washington, no one would have believed you. Bloomberg's Greg Ricordi, we thank you so much for the time and the insights today on balance of power. The Supreme Court in a unanimous decision this morning also, as we mentioned, upholding access to the abortion pill Mifepristone. Speaker Mike Johnson addressed the politics of abortion after House Republicans met with Donald Trump. President Trump, the way he addressed the issue this morning uh, is he said, make sure that you exercise your own conscience, to talk about it, share your conviction and, um, and, and do that uh, in a way that makes sense to people. And, uh, and I think uh, he had made a good point. He, he has said that after the Dobbs decision that um, the, the states are handling the issue right now, and that's where he's comfortable keeping it. And, uh, you know, we've made the point that before you can have political consensus on a, on a difficult issue, you have to have cultural consensus. And, and right now, we just don't have the numbers in Congress to do anything on the federal level, and that's just the reality. As we now add the voice of Bloomberg's Saleya Mosin at the table with us here in Washington. Saleya, your thoughts on this ruling today that came uh, roughly a, a moment or two roughly after uh, 10 a.m., just as Donald Trump was speaking in the meetings that we're describing here today, maybe the, the biggest gift politically that he got during his visit to Washington. Would you agree? Well, what we saw happen was that the Dobbs ruling really energized mm -hmm. this issue for Democrats. And what we've the information that now we have from the Supreme Court, this ruling kind of uh, takes the teeth away from the Democratic Party in uh, trying to say that this is going to be the reason, this and January 6th are the yeah. reasons that people should go to polls and vote for Biden. That risk has been kind of neutralized for the GOP. And so, yeah, for like you're saying, Joe, there is a little bit of a gift here. The thing is that there's still a down ballot effect sure. in some states that are GOP majorities run by GOP governors and state legislatures. There is still an issue uh, to contend with here, and that mm -hmm. does start to affect down ballot. He just didn't have to answer to this in the same way he would have if it had been struck down. Certainly. Well, and I wonder about what the justices have to answer to as well. Of yeah. course, they're appointed for life. They don't have to be reelected like other lawmakers. But we know that the court as an institution has seen its, its credibility and its faith among the American uh, electorate degrading in recent years. And part of that may have to do with the Dobbs decision. Does this potentially add more credibility back to the court? It just might. You know, there's been uh, studies and polling from Pew Research and Gallup that have revealed that government trust as an, as, at a historic level. And a lot of that has to do with the Supreme Court, the Dobbs ruling, the ethics scandal with Clarence Thomas and the other uh, sort of smoke around that fire at the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And so now what we're seeing is that maybe they are meeting the, the public where they're at. When it comes to abortion politics, uh, and also if we're going to think about who this affects the most, suburban women. Right. And that's an in important constituency in the upcoming election. Indeed. Bloomberg Saleh Mosin, thank you so much. Turning to Italy now, where G7 leaders came together to send Ukraine an additional 50 billion U.S. dollars by the end of the year via frozen Russian assets. President Biden commenting on the aid after meeting with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Back in 2022, two days after Russia's invasion, members of the G7 and the European Union worked together to freeze $280 billion in Russian central bank funds outside of Russia. I'm very pleased to share that this week, this week, the G7 signed a plan to finalize and unlock $50 billion from the proceeds of those frozen assets. To 
put that money to work for Ukraine. Joining us now from the G7 in Bari, Italy, is Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern. So, Anne-Marie, you have the $50 billion unlocked. You now have signed this 10-year security agreement between the U.S. and Ukraine. Did Biden accomplish everything that was on his to-do list at this summit? These are the deliverables the U.S. certainly wanted to see going into this G7. And we should note that the negotiations were tough, especially when it came down to getting Ukraine front-loading that money on the interest that would accrue on the securities that are currently frozen, $280 billion worth, mostly in Europe, uh, of these securities that are frozen. It took months to get to this point for the U.S. to really convince, notably the Europeans, that just sending 3 to $6 billion of that interest, of those interest payments a year wasn't enough, and to really front-load it and to give Ukraine a big number. And then signing the Bilateral Security Act, which Ukraine did with a number of other nations, but really what Zelensky said was unprecedented with doing it with the U.S., almost election proofs Ukraine ahead of the, notably the U.S. election if potentially uh, you would get a Trump 2.0 administration that maybe didn't agree with the way the Biden administration was handling Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but also other elections that are taking place in G7 countries. So for Biden, this was a success and a win on the global stage. The issue, of course, he faces, like many of these other G7 leaders, is that they are dealing with an electorate that doesn't always see eye to eye on what priorities they're discussing at the G7 table. Whether or not it's France, Germany, the UK, the US, polling continues to show that the economy, cost of goods, inflation and immigration weigh large. Well, this is a big day for the president of the United States and a lot of talk back here in Washington, Anne-Marie, about the split screen uh, with Donald Trump, who made his big return to Washington for the first time since January 6th. And the president today in Italy did have to speak to domestic politics as well. He got a lot of questions, or at least a couple, off the path when it came to Ukraine. Uh, what's your takeaway from the conversation that he had today with reporters, including our own Josh Wingrove at Bloomberg? Yeah, he wasn't too happy about Josh's question there and said, you know, you reporters, mm -hmm. sometimes you don't follow the rules. I think the rules is that you can just ask an elected leader uh, anything you want as a journalist. Uh, but he wants to talk about Ukraine, and Josh asked a question about Gaza. The previous uh, AP reporter also asked about his son, Hunter Biden. Biden, uh, the President Biden, reiterated that he would not pardon his son, Hunter, who was convicted um, guilty on these gun charges this week. This is obviously weighing on the president. He's been trying hard to s separate the professional from the personal. But obviously, this is very personal for him. This is his son. He said he stand by his, stands by his son. What was interesting is that when the G7 uh, press conference between Biden and Zelensky wrapped up, he was shouted at these questions, will you commute the sentencing? And Biden said no. So he went a step further this evening than we have seen him or the White House go prior. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern with us live from Italy. Anne-Marie, thank you so much for the reporting and for being with us here on Balance of Power. We have breaking news on the terminal, Kaylee, uh, that brings us to a very different matter, and that's the shareholder vote today at Tesla. Number one, uh, Tesla shareholders voting to approve Elon Musk's $56 billion pay package. It appeared to be going in that direction this morning, and we can tell you that officially now. Investors at Tesla also back moving the jurisdiction for, uh, to Texas from Delaware, Kaylee. A really interesting development as part of this vote today. Yeah, we don't actually know what the breakdown of the votes was, but of course Elon Musk himself had basically foreshadowed this outcome last night, saying mm -hmm. that he saw both of these things passing by wide margin, and indeed, they have both passed, Joe. Had institutional support, which brought us to this point earlier today. And we're looking at Tesla shares right now up a little more than 4% in after hours trading on this news. Coming up, we'll take a deeper dive into the $50 billion G7 countries are tapping to help Ukraine, as Anne Marie was just discussing, coming from profits of frozen Russian assets. Evelyn Farkas of the McCain Institute will walk us through it next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio.
we have uh, a, an in-depth um, agreement today, and it's a very uh, powerful uh, message. And uh, it will be the task of the technical team in the days to come, in the weeks to come, to put it uh, to, 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 to put it in concrete terms. But the the, the orientation is very strong, and uh, all the leaders we want this agreement to be implemented. European Commission President Charles Michel earlier today speaking about the plan to release roughly $50 billion associated with frozen Russian assets to Ukraine. That just breaking today as President Biden was joined by Volodymyr Zelensky in making that announcement. We now bring in Evelyn Farkas, executive director of the McCain Institute at Arizona State University, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Russia and Ukraine. Evelyn, it's great to see you. Uh, the promise uh, of new monies is obviously uh, to the benefit of Ukraine, but President Zelensky was asking for more. He wants fighter jets and the ability to use U.S. provided weapons in areas beyond Kharkiv. Will he get both of those eventually? Well, Joe, if history is any indication, yes, eventually he will. Um, we know, having looked at the um, long track record of the Ukrainian president asking for things from the United States and other allies, that eventually he gets it. Um, it doesn't always happen right away, but you might remember he wanted Javelin anti-tank missiles. That's when I was in the Pentagon. Um, we said no. Uh, actually, President Trump's administration okayed it. Then later on, he wanted tanks. We in the Europeans said no. He got them. He wanted um, the longer range missiles. We said no. Eventually, he got them. Um, and of course, the fighter aircraft, we said no and he got them. He would like more of them, mm -hmm. uh, and I think yeah. that's great. Uh, he also needs more pilots, and he needs more trained pilots, so it's not just an issue of uh, aircraft supply. Well, okay, Evelyn, so all of this just seems to be a matter of time. How long will it be until the U.S. gives in to Ukrainian demands? How long will it be that this war is ongoing? What we do know a time frame for as of today, though, is this security agreement that Biden and Zelensky signed 10 years. Does that Trump-proof the U.S.-Ukraine relationship, should he be elected in November? So, Kelly, I, I don't know that it necessarily Trump proves it, to be honest, because as everyone's pointed out, it's not a treaty. Um, it's not a re it's not something that the United States is bound to as a nation, meaning through a vote in the Senate. It's just an executive decision. It's a political agreement. It's symbolically important. We're saying that we believe that Ukraine will prevail. We're going to back them up for 10 years. We're going to help their military industry. But I think what is Trump proof is actually the deal on the money. The fact that they're going to take this 50 billion um, and give it to the Ukrainians to spend on their defense, to spend on their reconstruction is significant because I think it opens the door to taking the rest, to taking the $300 billion that's sitting mostly in European accounts, but also in the U.S. That is a game changer. That tells Vladimir Putin that Trump or no Trump, um, the West is behind Ukraine. The democracies are behind Ukraine. And he can't outspend Ukraine, frankly, if they have access to that entire $300 billion. Evelyn, I, I know you just returned from a trip to Japan and Taiwan. And I want to ask you about uh, a more aggressive posture uh, from China that we've been hearing and some of the rhetoric that we've been hearing most recently, saying that the U.S. poses the biggest security challenge in the South China Sea with the military deployment that is turning into, quote, the whirlpool of an arms race. We heard from China's vice foreign minister just a couple of days ago referencing what is happening in the Philippines right now. How concerned are you about an escalating situation there? Well, Joe, I don't like the rhetoric. I used to follow North Korea in addition to East Asian security issues um, when I was on the Hill in the Senate. And, you know, the North Korean rhetoric was always over the top. And the Chinese these days sound a lot like the North Koreans, which is um, frightening because it doesn't cool the tempers. And the Chinese are reacting to the fact that the Philippines are not letting them get away with pushing them out of disputed territory where the Philippines have a presence. They have a ship on a shoal. You know, it's like a little piece of land in the, in the middle of the South China Sea. And yeah. the and the U.S. government is backing up the Philippines' right to remain on that ship, on that bit of land. Um, but they're being harassed, literally, by Chinese military vessels. 
um, and other Chinese um, fish, you know, other Chinese vessels that are not necessarily, strictly speaking, military, but they're sanctioned by the government. Um, so the Chinese are upset because we are standing up to them along with the Philippines and others. They are, though, I will say what we heard in Taiwan and also in Japan was a lot of concern about how aggressive the Chinese are, the need to actually hold and deter, hold the Chinese back closer to their mainland, closer to their territory. Um, don't let them get so close to Taiwan and into the Straits. So that means we need to be out there with our ships. Um, we need to be with our allies, demonstrating freedom of navigation, going through all those international waters mm. that the Chinese are trying to claim as their own. All right, Evelyn Farkas of the McCain Institute, thank you so much for joining us. and glad you made it back safely. Now coming up, we'll take a look at the political effects of today's Supreme Court decision on the abortion pill, Mifepristo. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. talking about really extending these tax cuts again the portions that are expiring we are talking about even larger a price tag upwards of four trillion dollars and then there are other things they are talking about including some of the business tax cuts that have expired could bring you up to five trillion dollars that was Maya McGinnis, the president of uh, the committee for a responsible federal budget talking with us earlier about the possibility of extending the Trump era tax cuts, which is the debate that's just getting underway right now in Washington. And Kaylee, that kind of took on new life today as mm -hmm. Donald Trump addressed CEOs at the business roundtable. You were down there, the wharf here in Washington for that conversation. And it's a question about balancing uh, the attractiveness of tax cuts with a ballooning deficit in a time that we're trying to fight inflation here. This is a difficult balance. It is. Now, he's talking about reducing the corporate tax rate to 20 percent. He also wants to keep in, in place the 2017 tax cuts that he enacted during his first administration. And that's something we spoke about with Kevin Brady, the former chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, earlier, or actually yesterday, on this program. I think it's going to be crucial for both parties to find a way forward to extend those tax cuts, especially for those families, Main Street businesses and our competitiveness. You may remember the reason we did it was that for a decade before 2017, the economy was slow growth, less than 2% for, for a decade. Mm. Paychecks have been flat and every other month we saw another U.S. company move overseas. That was Kevin Brady yesterday. Coming up next, we'll take a look at the Supreme Court ruling today upholding access to Mifepristo. Mary Ziegler will be with us next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is not a cause for celebration because the reality is certain things are still not going to change. Uh, we are looking at the fact that two-thirds of women of reproductive age in America live in a state with a Trump abortion ban. This ruling is not going to change that. That was Vice President Kamala Harris earlier today speaking about the Supreme Court's decision to uphold access to Mifepristone, a widely used abortion pill across the country. Let's bring in now Mary Ziegler, law professor from the University of California, Davis, and author of Abortion and the Law in America, Roe v. Wade, to the president. Mary, welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. When we consider what this actual decision was today, what the majority said, and this was unanimous, is that the doctors and organizations that sued over this lacked the legal standing to do so because they weren't directly affected by the FDA's approval of this. So does that actually lead open a fairly wide door that, of future vulnerability for Mifepristone access? Absolutely. I mean, there are any number of threats to Mifepristone access that are not based on the exact legal arguments in this case. But this ruling doesn't even shut down the exact legal arguments in this case. And we know already that the states of Kansas and Missouri have vowed to bring their own claims and are arguing that they have a better case for standing uh, than did the plaintiffs here. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to access to Mifepristone and challenges to it. So... We're not done with this conversation, obviously. Are you surprised by this unanimous ruling? 
I mean, not, I, I shouldn't be, right? I mean, we should still live in a world where standing arguments that are this ridiculously poor are rejected unanimously by the Supreme Court. Uh, historically and traditionally, the court is often unanimous on what should be easy legal questions, and the standing arguments raised by these plaintiffs were so atrociously bad that you would like to believe that the court could agree that they were atrociously bad and in fact did. Um, I think, of course, that means we can't read too much into it either. This isn't even the last abortion case we're going to hear from the Supreme term, uh, much less for the longer foreseeable future. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Mary, because they do still have to rule on decisions about when the life of a mother is at risk in an emergency scenario uh, is, is another decision coming up. Do you expect that one will be so easy to find such consensus on the high court? No, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if that case isn't even a 5-4 case. It wouldn't surprise me if that fractured the court even more. Uh, we saw at oral argument that a majority of the justices seemed ready to say that federal law doesn't do anything to stop states from denying access to abortion in medical emergencies. But even with that being true, the, the justices seemed pretty closely divided about what to do and even more divided about why to do it. In other words, even if Idaho is going to eke out a win in the case, the justices didn't seem to be in agreement about on what rationale. Um, so that's likely to be a very divisive case on, of course, a very emotional subject, um, which is access to these emergency treatments for people, not just who are seeking abortion, but people with wanted pregnancies who are confronting stillbirth, miscarriage, and other dangerous pregnancy complications. So Mary, what does this mean then, today's ruling for some states that have moved to restrict access to mail order abortion pills like mifepristone? Well, in the, in the short term, nothing actually changes, right? So the FDA's rules that currently prevail, which permit telehealth abortion in states where abortion is legal, are still on the books. Um, states that mm -hmm. have sought to criminalize all abortion, including, of course, access to mifepristone through mail, are still going to attempt to enforce those rules. And the questions really about the fate of mifepristone at the federal level are going to be pushed past the election, uh, both because we haven't heard from the Supreme Court on the plaintiff's claims on the merits, claims both about whether the FDA had the authority to approve mifepristone, and also claims about whether the Comstock Act, which is a 19th century obscenity law, um, can be reinvented as the 21st century abortion ban. So we don't know what the Supreme Court has to say about that, and we also don't know what a potential second Trump administration would do on either of those points. So, for example, you know, would a second Trump administration try to withdraw approval for mifepristone? Would it put new restrictions on mifepristone? Would the Trump administration interpret or enforce the Comstock Act as a ban? Like, we don't know any of that, but essentially what this ruling does is kick the can down the road until after the election, um, when, of course, voters won't be able to do anything about any of this, but when the issues will be less politically yeah. salient. But Mary, essentially, the gist of what you are saying is that this has the potential not only to, to shift the reproductive rights landscape in terms of actually providing mail order pill abortion access, but also just the authority of the Food and Drug Administration moving forward. Yeah, so if, the, if these claims continue to be made, which they appear to be, again, because attorney, the attorneys general of Missouri and Kansas have stated their intention to continue pursuing these claims, um, th they are challenges to the authority of the FDA. It would set a precedent whereby other people who are unhappy with other drugs or treatments, whether that's COVID-19 vaccines or prophylactic drugs for HIV AIDS or um, you know, even vaccines for measles, mumps, and rubella could challenge their approval mm. in federal court and ask judges who are not, of course, scientists or even particularly literate about scientific evidence to second guess the scientists at FDA. Um, so at the moment, of course, these cases are focusing on abortion, but there's no reason that they would have to remain that way. And that's one of the reasons we've seen um, the pharmaceutical industry come out pretty strongly against this litigation. And I expect you would continue to see that if these cases make their way through the lower courts. Mary, we started this conversation uh, with remarks there from Vice President Kamala Harris, whose statement today was, this is no cause for celebration. It sounds like you agree. Yeah, I mean, it's a small technical ruling, right? I mean, I think it, it doesn't really change much. 
Um, there were definitely some sort of good, small items of good news in the ruling for the anti-abortion movement. Uh, the court interpreted, for example, federal conscience protections for doctors with religious objections to abortion very broadly, more broadly than I have seen them interpreted in the past. That's something, of course, that physicians opposed to abortion can make use of going forward. And the justices quite simply didn't answer any of the major questions that had made this case a national news story. So. It's essentially not changing anything and not resolving anything. So for there to be a cause for celebration, we would have to know a lot more about whether the court was at on the substance rather than just these procedural matters. Mary, in addition to the court decision today, we got some other news here in Washington, which was an attempt by the Senate to pass uh, a, a bill that would federally protect the right to IVF in vitro fertilization blocked by Republicans. Those who opposed it argued essentially that it, it was too broad, that it was going too far. Could you just explain to us what that legislation actually would have done and why, why Republicans may have found that it was going too far if it was actually just trying to make sure that people can try to have more babies? Well, the, the federal legislation was, I think, a response to the Alabama Supreme Court's decision earlier yes. this year um, recognizing embryos as persons and was designed to kind of create a federal floor below which states couldn't go in putting restrictions on IVF. Um, Republicans, I think, are voted against the bill largely because IVF is a more complicated issue for their base than they're willing to acknowledge. A key piece of evidence for this was that just yesterday, the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest conservative mm -hmm. Protestant denomination in the United States, passed a resolution broadly kind of condemning IVF and calling on members of the church to lobby for legislation, either restricting IVF or criminalizing IVF outright. So Republicans can't just easily say they're for IVF, even if polls suggest that north of 80 percent of Americans support IVF, because critical portions of their base see IVF as involving the same kind of moral problem they find with abortion, essentially, right? If more embryos are created than implanted and you view embryos as persons, the destruction of embryos as murder, the freezing of embryos as abuse, um, the use of embryos for research is deeply problematic. So I don't think this is an easy issue for Republicans, and I think that's why we're going to continue to see votes like the one we saw today. Mary, it's great to have you back. Thanks for joining today. Mary Ziegler with us on Balance of Power here on Bloomberg TV and radio. Coming up, we'll look at Donald Trump's visit to Washington today, where he met with Republican lawmakers as well as business leaders. It's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. an idea, and I think it's a wonderful idea. You know, our tax code is expiring this year, and depending on which party controls the House of Representatives, will determine Americans and how much they pay in taxes. President Trump said, he said, this is an idea, but I'd love to raise tariffs. And then he said, maybe even no income taxes for Americans. Um, everyone was clapping in the room. I think that's a fantastic idea. And he even later joked, and he said, if you guys are going to go vote on something today, vote to lower taxes on Americans. I don't think he was saying as a serious policy. In fact, he, he kind of added that at the end that, you know, I'm not making any serious policy announcements here, but he does, I think, want to look at lowering the income tax and perhaps that could be offset and paid for with some type of tariffs, particularly on uh, adversarial nations. That was Republican Congressman Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia and Congressman Nicole Maliotakis of New York speaking with me earlier today after meeting with former President Donald Trump, who floated this idea of a tax plan and what it could look like, along with tariffs, if he were to be elected in November. Joining us now with more is our political panel, Lauren Tomlinson, president of Claffy Communications, and Alvin Jordan, Democratic strategist. So, Lauren, just to begin with you, obviously he was doing this in a closed-door meeting. We didn't know what was said until the lawmakers came out and tried to explain us, and as you can see, they had some different uh, versions of, of what exactly was said. But this idea of trying to bring taxes lower even if it takes higher tariffs in order to do so. Is that one that is going to resonate, not just with those in the room, but those who have the decision as to whether or not to vote Trump back into office? I think that Trump was very much, you saw this in the press conference afterwards, 
um, very much making the economic case for his presidency. And so I think, you know, with a lot of the things in closed door meeting with Trump and uh, the way that different people interpret the different things that he says all the time, um, we can't be sure exactly how serious he was about tariffs offsetting and, you know, zero income tax and some of the specifics of that. But I do think it was a nod towards um, he's going to have a very strong economic message the next couple of months, particularly with the debate coming up. He knows that Biden is weak on inflation, weak on where people feel the economy is headed. And so he's going to be proposing and floating a lot of these ideas, mm -hmm. tax cuts, ways to reduce inflation. Um, I think tariffs, more of these like populist um, policies will definitely be taken a forefront as he tries to uh, basically frame Biden as uh, failing the American people over the past four years. It's curious, though, because Republicans have criticized Joe Biden for spending too much money and mm -hmm. helping to stoke inflation and making the tax cuts permanent would cost something between four and five trillion dollars, according to the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. So is this an opportunity for Joe Biden to return fire or are we truly in a world where just nobody cares? We're, we don't care about debt and deficits anymore. I think it's the latter. I mean, like you just said the number, and I just, I didn't even flinch. And it's just like, I think that that <laughs> is well. probably just indicative of where we are just as a country, where it's like, how do I feel personally? Um, and I think people, you know, kind of vote with their own personal, you know, kind of, you know, wow. check checkbooks and, and how they feel kind of going to the gas pumps and things that we hear yep. kind of all the, all the time. And so I think, you know, as the former president floats these things out, for me, I just... I'm uh, more excited and kind of looking forward to the debates so that they could actually explain some of these things that, uh, to your point, are kind of being interpreted differently mm -hmm. depending on who's, uh, you know, kind of explaining it. And so I, I think, you know, as we get closer to the debate, hopefully we'll hear, um, you know, a bit more specifics uh, kind of around some of these points. Well, the debate is two weeks from tonight. Everybody mm. has that date circled <laughs> on their calendars. When we talk about the policy specifics that maybe we didn't get as much of today. A lot of the lawmakers coming out said this wasn't so much about outlining specific policy. It was about preaching Republican unity and Donald Trump in the room saying, we all need to be together. I'm here for you. You're here for me. Can that unity stick, Lauren, through to November, given everything we have seen out of these congressional Republicans specifically in this Congress? You know, I don't know that it's necessarily unity behind President Trump at this moment, because I think they did do a good job of everyone um, showing support um, of the former president and getting behind him today, as much as it is some of the um, primary fights that are still ongoing within congressional politics mm -hmm. at the moment and um, Republicans primarying each other and McCarthy's revenge tour and other things that are still playing out at this point. Um, so at some point that will be done and there will be unity and everyone will get excited in front of November. Um, ahead of November, but I do think that there's a long way to go with this um, with this caucus on how they're feeling towards each other. It's interesting uh, you, when you consider the evolution. What went through your head today as a Republican? And you're, you're a mainstream Republican, I think we can say that. That's, that's your background, would be considered establishment now. To see Mitch McConnell reaching across the table to shake hands and smile with Donald Trump. Mitt Romney actually showed up to this thing. The transformation is complete. I don't know if the transformation is complete or if um, Republicans have decided that there is a lesser of two evils here. Mm -hmm. And if we're voting for uh, responsible fiscal policy, we have a better chance with Trump to turn the economy around. And we'd rather see that than do another four years of President Biden. Um, Trump has done a very good job lately of supporting establishment candidates um, in their, you know, those primaries that I was just talking about. Yeah. He was mostly supporting incumbents against um, primary challengers. Um, he has done a very good job of outreach. I credit a lot of this to his campaign, which is very, very professional this time around versus 2020. Um, so I think that there's been, you know, we've seen Trump on message, Trump disciplined Trump today. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long we'll see that. Um, and if that will maintain all the way through. But it is a very um, different uh, Trump than we've seen. And I think the support that you see on, Con on uh, Capitol Hill reflects that. Mm. I, I wonder if it wasn't just a different Trump, but different lawmakers as well. Joe, you made the point earlier. If you asked a number of these individuals, including Mitch McConnell and Mitt Romney, on January 7th, 2021, yeah. if they would be welcoming Donald Trump back to the Capitol, Not a chance. you probably would have gotten a different answer then. We, 
we got from them today, Alvin. This was the first time he was back on Capitol Hill since the events of that day, welcomed with open arms. Does that actually actually suggest that that day no longer has real resonance in American politics in this moment and therefore isn't going to be an issue that Democrats can rely to campaign on this time around? It sure felt like it today. Um, yeah, I was I was on the Hill earlier today, and it, it did feel kind of eerily celebratory in a, in a way from, you know, the Republican standpoint. And, you know, I'll say just to, you know, kind of use the adage, you know, time heals all wounds type of thing. It, you, that very much felt like, you know, it was kind of coming through as um, some of the kind of uh, post-meeting uh, pressers that were happening kind of in, in real time as I was um, on the Hill today. And so I, I think, you know, the president and the administration currently will continue to hit those points and try to, you know, remind uh, the American people of, you know, kind of just, you know, what, what you mentioned as far as January 6th. But, yeah, you have to be somewhat concerned to see everything seemingly going so smoothly um, for the uh, former president, um, you know, based on today, if that was any indication. Yeah, for Democrats sure. definitely tried to remind people of January 6th today. The Biden-Harris campaign had the ad. There was the, we were just talking about sure. the van that was following Trump around and blasting everything. And, uh, you know, to your point, I don't know that it's resonating as much because the time has mm -hmm. gone by um, and people are very much thinking in the moment. So deficits don't matter. January 6th of that. <laughs> Coming up with our panel, a look at the Supreme Court's decision this morning to uphold access to Mifepristone and what the implications might be for elections this November. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines in Washington. Today, the Supreme Court announced a unanimous decision to uphold access to the abortion pill Mifepristone. As we reassemble our panel now for their take on the implications, Lauren Tomlinson, president at Claffey Communications, is with us, along with Alvin Jordan, Democratic strategist. Great to have you both here. Uh, this was just one more headline to drop today. You were up on Capitol Hill. You mentioned uh, earlier today, Alvin. I'm trying to get a sense of what this means, if anything, different on the campaign trail. Kamala Harris said today, there's nothing to celebrate here. This is the same message from the Democratic Party and from the Biden campaign moving forward when it comes to reproductive rights. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I do. I think it uh, it opens the door, right? It, and it activates the vice president in this way. And I think this is a, a positive for the Biden administration to actually, you know, allow the vice president to go out and kind of have these talking points, both as a reminder, similar to the points we were making in the previous segment, but more so just to um, I think continue to keep what, you know, is one of the top issues headed into the election top of mind for, for voters and also just kind of understanding that the fight is still ongoing. Um, I think it is, you know, timely in the sense that, you know, we're coming up on the anniversary of, of Dobbs and then also, you know, with uh, us being a couple of uh, weeks away from the debate. And so I think that the, you know, the Biden administration and team will for sure hit this, you know, very hard and, and look at it um, as yeah, a tiny victory, if anything, today and, and really kind of keep um, the focus of the American people hopefully kind of on the on the issue and fight at hand. Mm -hmm. I realize that the Dobbs decision was more recent than January 6, 2021, but we were just talking about how memories seem to be quite short. And with the passage of time, you lose a bit of a galvanizing effect on some of these issues. Abortion may very well be one of them, Lauren. Is this a gift to Republicans? Because it didn't just provide a regalvanizing force of reproductive rights becoming more restricted and therefore encouraging more people to go out and try to vote to protect them. Yeah, I think definitely in the general election, you have to remember that Republican um, base voters are very passionate about abortion issues, um, and that's what's driving a lot of this within the Republican Party. So um, while we're in primary season and, um, and as far as getting that passionate base behind uh, Donald Trump, for example, and other Republican candidates, these abortion issues are important. But, you know, you saw Nikki Haley immediately tweet out, like when the IVF vote was happening, that this is something that has to be available for women. Mm -hmm. um, Donald Trump was talking uh, to the Republican conference today about um, and making sure that there are always exceptions in any laws that are going forward. And, you know, again, not committing to any policy positions, but making sure that there was a more moderate stance. I think the Republican Party is going to continue to struggle to message this for a little bit. And it's going to be a continued attack um, from Democrats. Um, but as you said, 
let's see what's happening in October. What's our October surprise? Yep. Because people's memories are very short. And so as long as Republicans can continue to put forward moderate proposals on this on the national stage, hopefully it won't become a, a defining mm. issue for the general election and they can keep the focus on the economy. Well, Donald Trump himself has said that this is a problem for suburban women. We have less than a minute left, Alvin. That's to the benefit of Joe Biden. Yeah, and I think... When you look at it, it you, you can't, if, if I'm the Biden administration, allow Trump to kind of be very loud and, you know, kind of taking credit for overturning Roe, as he's mm -hmm. put it, but yeah. also not have the, the backlash that kind of comes with that in the same um, front. So I'll be very interested to see, you know, kind of one of the points today was, uh, I think, the former president, you know, really framing how, you know, the Republicans talk about this moving forward. Yeah. Great conversation with our great panel, Lauren Tomlinson, Alvin Jordan. We thank you for being with us. A lot of moving parts today. That's why you want to be with us every night here on Balance of Power. And you can continue that with the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. We'll see you back here tomorrow on Bloomberg TV and radio.